From the virtual stage of the 92nd Street Y, hello and welcome to our civic series, Race to City Hall. My name is Seth Kinski and I'm the CEO of the 92nd Street Y. I'm honored to be here to host these one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading mayoral candidates, covering topics of importance to all New Yorkers, including some suggested by members of our 92nd Street Y community. Thank you all so much for joining us. As we all know, the last year has been an incredibly difficult one for our city. To overcome our challenges, New York is gonna need a decisive, collaborative, and creative chief executive. It is for this reason that we at the 92nd Street Y have launched this series. Today, I'm speaking with mayoral candidate, Sean Donovan. Mr. Donovan has had a long career working on housing and fiscal policy at both the federal and local levels of government. He served in President Obama's cabinet as secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and as the Director of the Federal Office of Management and Budget. Prior to these roles, he was the Commissioner of New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development under Mayor Michael Bloomberg. He also served in the Clinton administration as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing at HUD and as the Federal Housing Authority Commissioner. Sean, thank you so much for taking the time and being here with us today. Thank you, Seth, for having me, and it's great to see you again. You as well. And, and before we, we dive into questions about your positions on various policies, I, I wanted to start, as we always do, by just asking how you and your family have been holding up during the pandemic. Well, thank you for asking, <laughs> Seth. Um, I, I feel deeply lucky as someone who got COVID very, very early on in the first wave uh, to have recovered very quickly, not had uh, bad symptoms. Uh, but to see the, my city suffering uh, around me is something that is profound. And, you know, it brings me back to why I decided to run in the first place. Um, you know, I grew up in this city in the 1970s and 80s during a different time of, of crisis. And this is a moment when we need everyone to step up in the city uh, to, to repair, to rebuild. And it's been profound to see the, the pain and loss uh, in New York, but also to see the way New Yorkers are stepping up and helping each other, neighbors helping neighbors to build back during this, this difficult time. So it's both deeply sad and, and inspiring at the same time for so many of us. Well, I, I wanna spend most of our time talking about your plans for building back. Um, but uh, before we jump into those, um, I, I wanted to ask one question about your lengthy government experience. Um, and more specifically, I wanted to ask a question about your time working under Mayor Bloomberg, which uh, was an experience that both of us shared. Um, the reason I wanna start with this is that in connection with these conversations, uh, we ask our community what topics they'd like to hear about. And in your case, there were a few members of our community um, who expressed curiosity uh, about your time uh, in city government. Now, I know that in the world of New York City politics today, being a former Bloomberg administration official may not always be viewed as a positive. Um, I, I will say from the questions that we received, I'm not sure that that's the way our community views it, but um, I know that that may be true um, in, in other communities in the city. So let me ask this very specific question. Um, acknowledging that any mayor who serves for 12 years um, is gonna have lots of accomplishments and lots of missed opportunities to which to point. Um, when you look back at the Bloomberg administration, are there areas of which you're particularly proud um, or about which you feel regret? And what lessons have you taken from both of those? Well, Seth, um, you and I share this and uh, maybe when we're done with the interview and it's still possible we can, uh, or it's possible once again, we can go for a drink and, and uh, reflect on this even more. What I would say is, is a few things. I am deeply proud of my public service for more than five years in the, in the Bloomberg administration and having led the creation of the most ambitious affordable housing plan in the nation at the time, I think is a, is a real uh, legacy. Obviously, there's more work to be, to be done there. And in particular, um, 
it seems a long time ago now, what we faced the most profound issue was the beginnings, the early days of the mortgage crisis, the foreclosure crisis, predatory lending, that really was the thing that created the Great Recession. And so I was at the front lines of creating a real community-based effort to preserve home ownership, to preserve wealth, particularly in black and brown communities in the city. We created something called the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, which became a model for other cities around the country. And it was one of the things that I think led President Obama to notice my work and, and ask me to, to be his housing secretary. And so of all of the work that we did, the most urgent and I think the most profound was that work around uh, the oncoming mortgage crisis and, and the devastation. We should remember that by the time that President Obama even came into office, nearly half of black and brown wealth in this country had been decimated by that, by that mortgage crisis. So it was really profound. And you know, this, this goes to a, a, a personal experience. You talked about my resume and my background in government. What most folks don't know, I, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I actually grew up around the corner from the 92nd Street Y. I uh, played a big part in my childhood. But what I saw as a kid in New York was homelessness exploding on our streets. I saw the South Bronx burning. And it lit a fire in me to go to work on behalf of the city that I love. And one of the very first things I did is go to work with an amazing group of church leaders and religious leaders, congregations, not just churches, mosques, synagogues, and created something called the East Brooklyn Congregations that built more than 5,000 homes in Brownsville and East New York that created real wealth and, and was named after Nehemiah, the biblical figure who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And so for me, that experience to go back into the very same neighborhoods under Mayor Bloomberg and try to preserve the wealth that I'd helped to create in the home ownership was a, was a profound uh, experience. So that's a very specific example. Stepping back, I guess, I guess the last thing I would say, Seth, is while I didn't agree on everything with, with Mike Bloomberg, the way I see it, he was a strong leader and a great manager. And if you look at issues like public health, where the average lifespan of New Yorkers increased faster than under any mayor uh, in, in our history, if you look at the work that was done on climate change and New York City being a world leader on so many uh, issues, if, if you look at the physical revitalization of this city that you and so many others played such a leading role in, I, I think there are many, many things in addition to the work that I did uh, very specifically in housing, but more broadly that I was a part of and that you were a part of, that New Yorkers are and should be very, very proud of. And I think we need a mayor who is really focused on how we make this a city that works again and works for everyone and how we make it a city that leads the world again in many different areas. So let's pick up on that theme and talk about the mayor that we need. Um, and um, one of the areas uh, clearly that the next mayor is going to have to address is our economy. Um, and um, I think the statistics at this point are well known, even after we've clawed our way back from the lows of last year, we're still down 500,000 jobs from our pre-COVID uh, levels. Unemployment today is at 12%, which is twice the national level. Um, and in response to this on, on your campaign website, uh, you talk about um, creating 500,000 jobs uh, for New Yorkers over your first four years in office, which essentially would undo the employment damage that COVID um, uh, re, uh, uh, resulted in in New York. And you also talk about wanting to make sure that those jobs uh, go not just to highly skilled workers, but also to some of the workers who were being left behind even before COVID hit. So let's imagine for a second that the election were tomorrow, which you probably wish that it were, um, and you won the election. Um, when, when you took your seat on City Hall, uh, in City Hall on your first day, uh, what would be the, the three initiatives that you would focus on first that you think would have the greatest um, uh, impact on your ability to achieve these very ambitious goals? Well, Seth, 
let's be clear. There is no recovery for our economy without ending COVID-19, ending this pandemic in our city. And so hopefully by the time uh, I win this race and take office, we have that pandemic under control. But you asked the question, if I were going to be in tomorrow, we have to end the, the pandemic. And unfortunately, we've seen a response to the pandemic that has actually made the damage worse, that has put more New Yorkers at, at risk. And I think for me, the moment that crystallized it was the moment when Mayor de Blasio decided because his health commissioner, Oxiris Barbeau, had pushed him to ensure that we were moving more aggressively. Uh, in reaction, Mayor de Blasio took away contact tracing and testing from our health department, arguably the best health department in the world, and gave it to our health and hospitals corporation. And I think, you know, you asked earlier about, about Mayor Bloomberg. I would say both from Mayor Bloomberg and from President Obama, I learned that in a moment of crisis like this, the single most important thing for any leader is to surround yourself with people who will tell you the truth, not to send a signal that you want to hear the opposite. You just want to hear, uh, you know, uh, compliments and, and what's going right. You need people around you to tell you what's not working so that you can go to work fixing it. And fundamentally for me, we need to see a leader in City Hall who knows what to do in a moment of crisis like this and how to organize every part of city government uh, to move. Look at our vaccine response. Look at the lack of access to technology. Look at the disproportionate access we've seen, particularly in communities of color. That needs to change. And so I have a very detailed health plan. Uh, go to www.seanfornyc.com and, and read about it. I'm not going to give you all 8,000 words here, but but one of the things that I would absolutely do is move all of our response efforts back under the Department of Health in New York City. Um, I would ensure that we're shifting resources right now uh, from the contact and trace, uh, testing and tracing directly to vaccines. I would be creating mobile units to go out and partnering with local community organizations that have the trust uh, of people who aren't getting vaccines who, who can literally go knock on the door of a senior who doesn't have a, an iPad to, to be able to sign up for an appointment and make sure that we're getting vaccines to those who need them as quickly as possible. I would also make sure at the same time that as we are making New York safe again, for our workers to go back to work, for our tourists to come back from across the country and across the world, that the world knows that we're safe again. And so I would partner with NYC and company to get the word out about everything that we're doing and to ensure that everybody feels safe, whether they're a New Yorker. We should be able to land at Kennedy or LaGuardia Airport um, and get an app that is developed by the leading technologists in the world that are here in New York to make sure that every time you walk into a restaurant, every time you walk into a Broadway theater, you feel safe. And that is gonna be incredibly important, not just in terms of getting the pandemic itself under control, but to make sure that we are broadcasting to the world and bringing New Yorkers back to New York and also bringing others back because tourism, all of the, our restaurants, arts and culture, so many things are so critical to the future economic success of New York as well. So those are a, those are a few of the things that I would make sure that we're doing. And let me just ask a follow-up question. Um, so, you know, we would broadcast to the world that New York is safe again and open for business, but there are some things that have fundamentally changed um, about New York and about society over the course of the last year. Um, with respect to New York, we have cultural institutions that have been shuttered. We have restaurants that have closed. Uh, a lot of the things that make New York an attractive place, not just for New Yorkers, but for people from all over the world, um, have certainly been negatively impacted and maybe worse. Um, and then in addition to that, you have this uh, very important question of whether the workplace has fundamentally changed and whether office workers will ever feel the need to come back to places like Midtown Manhattan or Lower Manhattan 
uh, which generate an enormous portion of our tax revenue. I think commercial real estate accounts for something like 10% of the city's total tax revenue, which is billions and billions of dollars. Um, so I, I guess the, the question for you is beyond just letting people know that New York is safe. Um, do you think that, I guess three questions. One is how fundamental do you think these changes are? Two is, do you think that there's anything that the city can do to mitigate these impacts? And three, if we assume that the changes just are what they are, how should the city adapt to this new world that we're living in? Yeah. So Seth, I wanna be very clear. Um, before we're broadcasting to the world that we're the safest city in the world, we have to make us the safest city in the world. And again, I, I wanna say, I'm the only candidate in this race who's actually sat side by side with Dr. Fauci, all of our military leaders, all of our health professionals to get a pandemic under control. Uh, when I was budget director, Ebola, Zika, again and again, we took on health threats. And so I think I understand in a way that nobody else does in this race, how to make sure we're the safest. But, but let me get to your question about, um, has the world changed in a fundamental way? And I would say, in, in my view, as somebody who uh, started off studying architecture and planning and cities, as somebody who has worked not just with Mayor Bloomberg, but as HUD secretary with leading mayors across the country and across the world, um, I believe we're living in an urban century for a reason. And in our modern economy, which is driven by data and information, by innovation and technology, what we've learned over and over again is that innovation happens when talented, creative people uh, get together and invent things that nobody else has seen before. And that only happens when people are able to connect in ways that aren't just over Zoom, but the random collisions. I, I always remember Eric Lander, one of the great biotech and uh, science leaders in the world telling me, most of the inventions in biotech happen at the water cooler and at the coffee shop because people who are inventing things start talking and, and realize the different connections. Those are the kinds of interactions that make cities the places of innovation and creativity. And it's a reason why the world's population is urbanizing, right? So I fundamentally believe that while the nature of our workplaces, how much time we spend it at home and, and at the office may change, that is not going to stop people from moving to cities. So I'm with Seinfeld on this. I believe cities will recover. We need to make sure that this city recovers. And one of the things that, you know, you and I both learned working with Mayor Bloomberg, but I also saw with other great mayors around this country, is that in this modern economy, talent decides where it wants to live and companies and capital follow. And if you believe that, then quality of life is actually the single most important economic development tool that any mayor has. And that means we need to have safe and clean streets. It means our schools need to be good. But it also means that our streets have to be alive, that our restaurants have to come back, that arts and culture have to come back. Because the thing that makes this a place people wanna live, is it being the most interesting, alive, surprising, amazing city in the world? And we have to be able to walk down the street again and find that pleasure of being in New York in a way that we've all been missing uh, this past year. And so. Part of what I would do as mayor, uh, I often say there's nothing wrong with New York that can't be solved by what's right with New York. Let's get our artists and our poets and our performers, not just back at the 92nd Street Y, let's get them into vacant storefronts and, on, and in our public plazas. Let's use what is so powerful about arts and culture in New York as a way to get folks excited about being back in this, this city again, because it is the thing that makes us unique. Uh, and it is the thing that can make sure not just cities come back, but that this city comes back. And um, let me stick with the art and culture theme for, for a second, and then I wanna come to, to some other questions. But um, as we talked about, um, New York has been devastated by uh, the pandemic. And um, 
that's true um, in so many different ways, including for our arts and culture sector. And um, the subsector of the economy that um, accounts for arts and culture has lost something like 70% of the jobs versus 30% for the economy as a whole, or 20%, I should say, for the economy as a whole. And whereas the economy as a whole has recovered 30% of what was lost, only 5% um, in, in the sector has been recovered. So the, the problems are deep, but we have fundamental problems that we're facing as a city. Um, we're facing enormous budget gaps. We're facing rising crime. We're facing increasing inequality, racial injustice. Um, and I, I guess you you started to tease this answer out, but I'm wondering if you can um, explain to people who might agree with you that arts and culture are important, why at a moment like this, we should be focusing on arts and culture instead of focusing on all these other bigger problems that we have. Well, Seth, um, this isn't an either or to me. Uh, President Obama used to say, you gotta walk and chew gum at the same time. That's particularly true in a, in a crisis like this. But I, I think unfortunately we have had a mayor who has thought of arts and culture as elite, as, as not a necessary part of the fabric of this city. And my answer to that is my neighbor in Brooklyn, Jorge Castro. He's one of six kids who grew up in a tiny town in Puerto Rico. He came to New York as a deeply talented musician because this was the place to play, the place to be. And he makes his life uh, playing in the pits on Broadway and touring with shows. And the economic ripples of our arts and culture through this city are profound. Just Times Square and theaters produce an enormous outsized share of uh, the revenues. And the, that is revenues for average New Yorkers, restaurant workers, service workers, lots and lots of folks that are aspiring to be middle-class who are, have been disproportionately devastated, as you said, by this. So we don't have a choice. We have to bring those jobs back. And as I said earlier, drive our recovery by showing the world once again that we are the most interesting, alive and vital place to live. But, but I wanna say one other thing as well about this, Seth, because part of the responsibility of a leader in a moment of crisis is to bring New Yorkers together, uh, to bind up our wounds as, as President Lincoln would say, and to move us forward. And there is no better way to repair the civic fabric of this city, which is such an important part of what our next mayor needs to do, not to demonize and divide us, but to bring us together as one city, than to bring us together through arts and culture. And, and let me be very specific about this. Um, as someone who was just a few blocks from the World Trade Center uh, when 9-11 happened. I watched the second plane hit the South Tower just five blocks away, my wife and I, that as a New Yorker feeling that profound loss, I will never forget looking up in the sky at the Towers of Light. That piece of art that allowed any New Yorker, no matter what you looked like, what language you spoke, where you lived, to look up into the sky and see a monument in light to our recovery, to see a piece of art that joined us together as New Yorkers and reminded us both of what we've lost and of what we have to rebuild was one of the most profound things that I, believe helped move this city forward. We need to do that again and again in this moment of loss. When we've lost almost 30,000 of our neighbors, we need a mayor who understands how to bind up our wounds, bring us together and move us forward. And I fundamentally believe that there is nothing more powerful to do that than our arts, our, our music, our poetry, our performances, um, and uh, sculptures in light if we need them. So 
So I'm sold. Um, and let's assume that everyone else is sold, that, that, that the arts are important and that we really need to prioritize them at this moment in spite of everything else that we're dealing with. I, I guess the logical follow-up question to that is, so, so what are we going to do? Um, and, and with some specificity, if you can offer it, what, what would your plan be for the arts and cultural sector to try to get this sector back up off, off the floor? Absolutely. And, and Seth, we need to be thinking both short term and long term, because part of this, honestly, is we have to get arts and culture out of the emergency room off life support and bridge that to the point where we can really reopen this city, hopefully later this year. Right. And so there's a very short term. How do we make sure we're helping the people and the institutions that drive arts and culture in this city. And then there's a longer term question of how we not only get back to where we were, but actually create an even more um, welcoming environment to, to arts and culture in the city. And on the short run, I wanna say, one of the things that's unique about me in this race is I deeply understand how we get the help we need from Washington DC to, to make this work. And literally, just to be very specific, our unemployment system has too often not worked for our performers and artists in New York, right? Whether they be uh, temporary workers or gig workers that haven't been eligible because they're waiting tables in restaurants or driving uh, an Uber, whether they have been unable to be able to get things like PPP, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, because it wasn't correctly designed to get to our arts institutions because they were too big or too small or um, uh, you know couldn't keep employees through this. All of those things need a chief executive at City Hall who really understands how to connect both our, our uh, people who work in arts and our institutions to the help that they need from Washington, D.C. And, and, and very directly, this is not something I'm just waiting to get to City Hall on. In December, when we were negotiating the last COVID relief package, I was on the phone, not just with all the leaders in the Biden, incoming Biden administration, but with three out of the eight gang of sen uh, eight senators on both sides of the aisle in Washington, helping them understand the specifics of how we need to construct aid so that it helps New York City broadly and it helps arts and culture specifically. And so, we need to do all of those things to ensure not just that we get a big relief package in Washington, but that it actually touches the ground here in New York City, uh, uh, on Broadway, on Main Street, everywhere around the city to help the people and the institutions that have been hit uh, so hard. And then in the longer run, we need to make sure that we're actually investing in our arts and cultural institutions in a way that continue to help uh, to help them grow. And that's something that is a big part of my economic development plan. Again, uh, go to www.shawnfornyc.com and read more about the campaign of ideas that I'm running, which has lots of specific ideas about how to grow arts and culture. And let, maybe if you can just take a, a minute or two to talk about, let's start just with um, the arts and culture piece of this. What are some of those investments that you envision making and, and talk about how you think that they would address some of the, the problems that the, the industry is facing at the moment? Well, I've talked about some of the shorter term things that we need to do uh, to make the city safe, my safest city commitment. And I've also talked about some of the ways to get to get aid there in the short run. So let me focus on the, on the longer run as well. Um, one of the things that we need to do is make sure that arts and culture is touching every part of our city. And this is an opportunity, I think, beginning in our schools to have a, a really deep engagement with our youngest students on the importance of arts and, and culture. There are amazing institutions uh, like Brooklyn Ballet and so many others that are in our public schools but haven't traditionally gotten the support that they need to ensure that we're creating real pathways um, and a real understanding at, at uh, a student level. I, I have a son who's a musician and fundamentally understand that if we, we do think that arts and culture is going to be a central part of our economy going forward and that we're gonna grow it, 
We have to start by ensuring that we are teaching it in our schools. We also need to make sure that we're connecting those students to opportunities in arts and culture. I've proposed in my education plan that every single New York City public school student should have at least one paid internship by the time they graduate high school. And we need to make sure that arts and culture is a place where our kids are learning that this is not just something that feeds their soul, but it actually might feed their family one day. And those kind of connections are something that is really, are really important that we do. And that that continues into CUNY and then into an internship program by the time they, they're leaving school as well. And so I proposed the New York City Job Corps, the most uh, expansive internship and training program the city's ever seen that will include a real commitment uh, to arts and culture as well. So those are just a few ideas about on the education side about how we uh, build that out. And it will ensure, I think, that we have an incredible diversity of institutions and people in arts and culture. Uh, we also need to be ensuring that the city itself is investing in smaller arts-based institutions and sports, sponsoring partnerships. I know you and I have talked about this, Seth. The 92nd Street Y has formed a number of, of partnerships. Um, our museums and others are, are doing similar things. We need the city to really be investing so that you can do more on those partnerships. You're one of our flagship cultural institutions in the city. You have a lot to teach those other uh, institutions as well as they're growing and trying to thrive. Uh, sponsoring mentorships and other ways to allow you to spread the wisdom uh, is, is something that I think could be really powerful as well in arts and culture. Now, I, I want to um, pick up on, on something that you said in that answer, and maybe widen the aperture a little bit again, um, beyond just arts and culture. Um, but you talked about, for example, arts education, um, and we at the 92nd Street Y through our Center for Arts Learning um, and Leadership, um, we uh, provide arts education to 15,000 mostly low-income public school kids throughout the city. Um, and what we're seeing um, is not increases in funding, but the threat of decreases in funding. And um, when you look at the budget picture more broadly, um, it's again, a fairly dire picture today. Um, the mayor's own budget that he put forward in January um, shows that if you were elected mayor, the first day that you stepped into office, you'd be inheriting a $4 billion uh, deficit and that that deficit would essentially be repeated year after year for as long as the projections go out. And if you speak to some of the experts who analyze the budget, they may they often say that that $4 billion is probably really more like $5 billion. Now, you have a series of proposals. You just talked about one, about funding arts more um, uh, in, in schools, but you have some pretty big plans and, and bold plans like um, your housing plan, where you talk about increasing capital spending by $4 billion a year um, for the first four years uh, of your time in office, which would generate hundreds of millions of dollars in additional debt service annually. Um, you talk about your equity bond proposal, which I thought was a very interesting one, but you talk about how it would cost $3 billion in the first year and then annually cost us $2 billion a year thereafter. Now, probably more than anyone else in the race, you understand how government budgets work. You ran the federal um, budget, which is the largest budget in the world. And as you know, um, at some point, we need to figure out how to make the sources and the uses balance. Um, and in cities, especially, we can't go into deficit spending. We have to do that annually. So th the question for you is, um, with all of these bold proposals that you have, most of which, the goals of which are, are hard to argue with, how are we going to actually afford to pay for all of this? Where do you propose that we can get incremental revenue? What would you cut to pay for that? How are you thinking about these things? Absolutely, Seth. And, and I think there are three key ways that we can do that. Um, but I wanna emphasize something that you said, which is this is not talk for me. I've actually walked the walk on this. Folks forget after the chaos and, uh, uh, misplaced priorities. I that would be an understatement of the last four years in Washington. People forget that when President Obama came into office, we had the biggest budget deficit since World War II. 
And by the time we left, we'd reduced it faster than any time since World War II while still making big investments in the Affordable Care Act, in education, in jobs, in housing. And so we can make the critical investments we need to as a city and get our budget under control if we have the right leadership. And it requires, I think, three key things. One is we need a mayor who actually understands how to get the help we deserve from Washington, D.C. We send $23 billion more to D.C. every year than we get back in return. That has to change. And as I said earlier, I've actually been working on that as a mayoral candidate at the very same time I'm running to ensure that New York City is getting the aid for our subway system, uh, to feed folks, to ensure that we get unemployment for our actors and, and actresses, all of those things and the housing aid that we need. And that can make an enormous, enormous difference. When we're talking about an almost $2 trillion relief package, how it's designed and how we move forward to get that aid going forward is gonna be critically important in a, in a mayor. And it could literally make the difference between a deficit and a surplus in New York, given the scale of, of uh, the help that we could get from Washington. So that's one, and I'm uniquely positioned to do that. Second, we need a mayor who actually understands where we can reduce the cost of government and how to do that effectively. Um, as you remember, every year in the Bloomberg administration, we were asked as agency heads to propose specific ways we could reduce the cost of government. That stopped happening over the last eight years. We've grown our city workforce by 30,000 people at the same time the city was already starting to shrink before COVID hit. Where can we look for savings? Well, as you know, the two biggest costs in, in city government are, uh, are people and our healthcare. And while I don't think if we get the help that we should be getting from Washington, we need uh, to lay off folks. What we do need to do is aggressively manage attrition, have a real hiring freeze um, in the city, and we can look much more effectively at controlling healthcare costs. The mayor actually has the power to lower the cost of prescription drugs. In our health and hospital system, there are many techniques that we pioneered, we call delivery system reform, that lower the cost of healthcare and improve quality that we should be implementing at the health and hospitals corporation uh, and in our uh, city health programs as well. So those are two big areas. The other thing I would though, say though, Seth, is there are plenty of places where we are spending more than we should and getting bad results. Homelessness is a perfect example. We're spending $3 billion a year right now on shelters and uh, to hotels for temporary housing. When we know that actually housing people saves lives and it saves money, how can that be? Well, if someone is sleeping on our streets, where do they get their health care? In the emergency room. They end up cycling in and out of Rikers, in and out of the mental health wings of our hospitals. We spend, think about this, Seth, we spend over $400,000 per prisoner per year in our uh, criminal justice system in New York. Over 400,000 per prisoner per year. If we could actually divert folks into housing, stop them from being incarcerated in the first place, as so often happens with our uh, with our homeless in New York, we could save their lives and improve their lives we, and save money at the same time. There are many, many places in our criminal justice system and homelessness where we're actually paying, for, paying more and getting worse results. And that needs to change as well. The last thing I would just say is we also need to make sure that we're growing our way out of this challenge as well. I talked about investing in quality of life earlier. Um, I do believe that there are places that we can get more revenue. As you remember well, you helped pioneer some of the really innovative ways that we paid for the number seven extension through what we call value capture, congestion pricing. There are many places where we could actually capture more revenue and put it to work in New York while still making sure that we're not uh, dramatically raising taxes and uh, increasing costs in New York, which I think could actually hurt our recovery and, and worsen the deficit in the long run. So we need a balanced approach that brings in revenues, lowers the cost, but we're not going to just tax our way to recovery uh, in New York.
And, and let me, I want to just pick up on that last point very, very quickly, because there's one other question I want to ask you that a, a patron sent in. Um, but are, are you saying that you don't think that we need to raise taxes at all, or just that we need to be judicious in how we raise our taxes? I, I think we need to be careful about it. And let me just give you a very specific example. We have one of the most progressive tax systems in the country right now. Um, I think a much better way to do this would be to roll back uh, many of the Trump tax cuts and make sure that New York is getting a larger share of that, that revenue. I think that's a better way that doesn't disadvantage New York. I also think our property tax system is actually the one place where we have a highly regressive system, a highly unfair uh, system. and that's an area that I would be looking not just to think about a pied de terre tax, which I think is, is uh, not going to solve the problem and is directed just at a very small share of New Yorkers, but to think more comprehensively about where our tax systems are unfair and not getting us the revenue that we, we should get. And those kind of reforms could actually not just solve immediate problems, but create us a, a fairer system in the long run. So let, let me pick up for the last question um, on your discussion of the concept of fairness. And I think one thing that all of us in New York can agree has been unfair is the fact that we have 400,000 people who are living in highly substandard housing uh, that's run by NYCHA, by our public housing uh, authority. Um, and this, again, is an area that, as a former HUD secretary, um, as a former housing secretary, uh, commissioner here in New York, you have, I think, a unique perspective on. Um, one of our patrons um, pointed out how little time is devoted on the campaign trail to this topic, given both its urgency and the fact that it impacts the very most vulnerable people um, in our city. And so I wanted just to ask you as a final question, um, how you would tackle this seemingly intractable problem that, uh, as you point out on your website, uh, requires at least an investment of $40 billion um, to try to address. So Seth, um, first I wanna say this is, while other candidates may not be talking about this as much as they should, this is something I talk about all the time. And in fact, I spent three hours at a forum in a church in bed Brooklyn last night with church leaders, public housing residents talking about exactly this. And this question is so on the mark. Th think about this. More people live in public housing in New York City than in Atlanta, Georgia. It is the single most important source of permanently affordable housing in this city. And we finally need a mayor who treats it like that. And, and unfortunately, uh, too often, public housing has not been at the center of plan. So what I've said is that for the first time, I would actually bring public housing squarely into the center of the city's housing plan. I would have a single deputy mayor that oversees everything that touches housing, including NYCHA and homelessness in this city, and ensure that we are actually making the progress that we need to. And here's the thing. This is also, you, you said, it seems like an intractable problem. I know it's not an intractable problem. I actually worked with mayors and housing authorities around the country to fix public housing that was in worse shape than New York. San Francisco was actually, believe it or not, in worse shape than New York. When I started as HUD secretary, we had a mayor, Ed Lee, who was committed to making change. And I was able to give him the tools that he needed. What are those tools? Well, for the first time ever, I created an effort as housing secretary that allowed public housing to bring public-private partnerships to the table, to raise capital the way any other affordable housing developer, nonprofit or for-profit could. And that, that effort has already helped to start renovating a million units of public housing around the country. But we have a mayor who was slow to take that up. And that needs to change. There are the tools available, particularly from the federal side to be able to bring billions, tens of billions of dollars into public housing. We need a mayor who understands that and is actually gonna take advantage of them. 
We also need a mayor who understands how to roll up their sleeves and actually fix broken systems. And let me just be very direct on this. Right now, if you're a public housing resident who's got a leak in your shower, by the time that the 15 different people who sign off on getting that repair fixed, do that all the way up to 250 Broadway, where NYCHA is just across from City Hall, that leaky faucet has turned into mold that's causing your child asthma. That's unacceptable. So we actually need to fundamentally bring the resources, but also bring the tools that ensure that any public housing resident can walk downstairs, go to the office, look the person in the eye who actually has the power, the tools, and the resources to fix that problem before it becomes much worse. And that doesn't exist right now. Um, that is just as important as bringing the resources is a mayor who actually knows how to roll up their sleeves and get it done. Mayor, mayor LaGuardia used to say, there's no Republican or Democratic way to take out the trash. I fundamentally believe we need to put fixing things ahead of ideology in this city. That's who I've been in my whole public service career. That's who I would be as mayor. And, and what about the, the financial piece of that? How do you, how do you get the, the money to do all of this? Other than you talked about the federal government, but are there, uh, and, and the city capital, are there other tools? Um, because even at $4 billion a year, you're not filling a $40 billion hole. Well, just on the federal side, Seth, to be clear, you could raise the vast majority of that 40 billion. If you could unlock section eight resources uh, through a number of different ways and you could get the approval at HUD, which I, I think I'm uniquely positioned to do in a Biden-Harris administration. Uh, many of my former team is coming back into HUD and will be there to, to help get this done. You could do the vast majority of it. But then what you also need is some city capital. We should remember that capital is actually at record low interest rates right now. So historically, even though it's hard to free up that money, this is actually a very good time to be investing capital and raising uh, at these record low interest rates. But the other thing is innovative partnerships. Think about this. We know that through uh, really innovative contracts with uh, those who could put solar panels on the roofs, replace the plumbing and electrical systems with much more efficient, uh, you can raise capital through innovative partnerships that pay for the capital costs with longer term energy savings. They're called energy performance contracts. And it's something that I pioneered in other uh, places in housing. NYCHA is a perfect opportunity. We've got almost 200,000 apartments. Think about all that roof space that could actually be solar and we could be putting NYCHA residents, training them and putting them to work, uh, building those uh, solar arrays, replacing the, the plumbing and electrical with much more efficient systems that actually save money in the long term. We could raise private capital off of that savings that could supplement the money from DC and get us to the $40 billion we need. Well, thank you very much for that answer. I, I feel like there's so much more for us to discuss, uh, both on this topic and more generally, but unfortunately we're out of time. So thank you for sharing your plans for the city with us and to our 92nd Street Y patrons, thank you for supporting and tuning in to the Race to City Hall series. Uh, please check back on our website for the most up-to-date schedule for future conversations. And in the meantime, from the virtual stage of the 92nd Street Y, we're signing off. We appreciate your joining us.